So welcome, everyone. Can you hear me well enough? Good. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Global Studies, I'd like to welcome you to our um, talk and discussion tonight focusing on Russian energy and European security challenges and policy implications. I think it's an understatement to, um, it, we shouldn't understate how important Russia is again <laughs> to our politics in a number of ways. So I think we might have a very interesting discussion both on energy and Russia and also looking at the European context. Um, I'm Jean Garrison, I direct the Center for Global Studies and I really wanna thank our partnership with the School of Energy Resources for making this possible, and also with the School for Politics, Public Affairs, and International Studies, which is also a partner in our hosting of Dr. Andreas Goldthau this week in Laramie. I would just want to point out that he's actually here with us for a week in a number of classes, and it's really super to have you participating in a number of discussions with our students, Andreas. Andreas is a professor of international relations at the University of London where he also serves as the director of the Center for International Public Policy. He's the director of the Center for International Public Policy, as I noted, and an associate, an associate with the Geopolitics of Energy Project at Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. He has a long pedigree, which includes affiliations with RAND, affiliations with SICE at Johns Hopkins, and also with the German Inst Institute for International and Security Affairs. His research interests focus on Eurasian energy security and the international political economy of oil and gas. And actually, we met through a mutual friend a couple of years ago when I was working on climate security policy issues, when I was also uh, based in Berlin. And he's one of these, he's, you know, he lives in Berlin, but he commutes to London. So you have a very interesting commute, I think, for your, for your professional life. Um, so we couldn't think of a better topic, I think, uh, because against the backdrop of the, Ur the Ukraine crisis and Russia's annexation of the Crimea, energy geopolitics are back in Europe. This talk will explore whether Russia, Russian gas import dependence poses a threat to European security and what the EU has done about it. It will advance the idea that the EU's policy response oscillates between economic and regulatory power, which is an effective approach to counter Russia's energy weapon. Let me just say that following um, Dr. Goldthau's presentation, we'll have a couple of panelists join us for comment. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Stephanie Anderson, who is the Director of the School of Politics, Public Affairs, and International Studies, who is an expert on the EU and security policy, and Dr. Robert Godby from the Center for Ec Energy Economics and Public Policy and the Department of Economics. So we'll have, a, we'll have a little bit of a panel discussion, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Goldthal. Come forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean, and, and the center for having me. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I had a blast this week. Um, I have been uh, very much welcomed by everyone, and I had great discussions with wonderful people, met really, really smart students, and. Uh, uh, and what was introduced into, into the local, you know, cuisine culture. So I'm, I'm really, really happy. It's, no, that was, to me, it's, it's such a treat. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm totally aware of the fact that you guys had to take a really tough choice today. It's Halloween. So, you know, your choice is being here. I'm very thankful for this. And I can't make up for anything that you might miss, at, but at least I can talk about scary stuff, you know? <laughs> so... <laughs> That's, that's the only thing I have on offer. And, um, and yes, it is about Russian energy and Euro European security and how we can think about all of this. And uh, obviously all of us have followed, you know, the news, what came, you know, uh, you know what came out of, out of Europe lately and the whole idea that uh, you had a few hiccups here and there, including, you know, the Russians cutting off the gas to Europe in 2006 or 2009. Uh, that, that was, I think, the turning point where were, you know, the, that European, the, the European dependency on Russian gas became an issue that was already, uh, it was already high on, on the agenda, but now became a real issue also in Washington, D.C., and was discussed in security circles. So it is timely, but before we go a little bit into what the EU has done about this and whether they can actually really effectively do anything about import dependence and what comes with it, uh, I guess what I would like to do quickly is get some numbers right. I mean, what we're talking about here is essentially a market, a European gas market of, and I'm sorry, I'm using the, uh, the metric system here. 
it translates somehow into TCF. But so we're talking about a 450 BCM market. Um, that compares to roughly 700, 750 BCM um, when it comes to the US. So it's a smaller gas market, but it, it is the biggest import market of gas in the world. And the reason why it's such a big import market is, A, we don't have a shale revolution, and there's a lot of envy over there. Uh, but second, um, there, is, um, there is simply not very much production going on in the first place. Um, the North Sea produces, uh, the Netherlands do produce, uh, there's no way around the corner, but in the end, what we're looking at is, is a production of roughly 100, 110 BCM that effectively uh, feeds that market of 450, and the rest is imported. Now, what you see here is um, what I plotted um, is projections on how that will go going forward. And whatever, whatever projection you look at, whether it's the one of, let me see whether I have a pointer here. Here it is. You know, whether it's the European Commission, which is, uh, you know, that blue one here, which is this, or whether uh, you look at um, uh, industry projections, Eurogas, that's here, for instance. I mean, whatever you look at, uh, production is going to go down. Uh, some of that um, is related to maturing fields. The North Sea is just not producing as much as it did produce in the past. But some of that is also due to policy. For the sake of the argument, the Dutch have just put a cap on production because they had a lot of seismic activity. And, um, and that didn't resonate very well with some of the, the constituencies in a country that's very small and populated by 16, 16 million people. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of reasons why production is going down. And, um, and that's a trend, whilst at the same time, um, gas demand is more or less flattening out. Um, there's only one projection that sees gas going a little bit higher. That's, that's the industry uh, association here, Eurogas. Every, every other projection says essentially, look, we're, we're flattening out. But still, what it gives you is a, is a huge delta. I mean, we're talking about roughly 300 plus BCM a year that need to be covered. And that's the import um, going forward. So that makes, going forward as well, Europe the largest import market on, the, uh, on this planet. And the interesting bit here is, um, the I mean, the question, the obvious question here is really, where does that stuff come from? I mean, does it all come from, from LNG sources? Or um, does it come possibly from, from uh, new fields uh, up in the north produced by Norway? Or is it actually uh, gas that will come from Russia? Now, chances are a lot of Russian gas will be in this. And that's for a number of reasons. The first is Russian gas is very, very competitive. Uh, we're talking about, and I have a number a little bit later, but we're, we're talking about um, Russian gas that at the moment is very competitive with, uh, with imported LNG. Uh, and the Russians have done a lot to keep it competitive. Um, they have been very flexible lately when it comes to pricing. Uh, because they know there is a market out there, and that's an important market, and that's a market, a market they want to keep and need to keep. But there is more. If you look at contracts, roughly 100 BCM of Russian gas are literally hardwired into the European import portfolio. So what you see here is the annual contract, uh, contracted quantity. That's, the, that's those, those blue bars. And because they all come on an LCC basis, meaning a long-term contract basis, they also have um, a take or pay clause in it that's a little bit flexible though. And that take or pay clause could um, see volumes being taken off anything from 70% upwards. So even if you say, look, 70% is, is, is what we're taking off out of the entire volume here, we're still talking about roughly 100 BCM going forward, way into the 2020s. Now, you could say, look, why don't we ignore contracts well, you could do this, but it would, all, would, it would come with all, with all sorts of problems, including um, uh, costs that, that, that relate to, uh, to breaking those contracts. And it is essentially, it is not only those contracts that matter. It is an entire industry structure um, reflecting those contracts, um, also in, in terms of um, how the supply structure works. So those long-term contracts give, give a whole bunch of, of, of European con, uh, contractual parties planning security on where their molecules come from way into the 2020s. In order to change that, they would need to change a lot when it comes to the infrastructure. 
So there's, there's literally three reasons why Russian gas will be there. A, it's, it's going to be competitive, and the Russians have a lot of it. Their production stands at 600, 650 BCM. They have a lot to export. Second, um, Russian gas is literally hardwired into the European import portfolio contractually. And third, the infrastructure simply suggests, and because it co-evolved with the contractual uh, patterns here, it suggests that it's going to be very, very hard to get away from those contracts uh, uh, in the short run or in the, uh, the medium term. So at the very end, what we're looking at is Russian gas. It's there, it's going to stay there for a long time to come. Now, why is this a problem? Is this a problem at all? Um, well, if you look at the news, and I guess you followed the news, but I give you a little bit of a heads up here, there have been a few issues. <laughs> I mean, obviously, Europe is conceived as, as, uh, as a gas station of Russia, if you look at uh, some of the, the outlets out there. Um, there is already for a long time a huge talk about the security implications, about Europe's import portfolio main, making the Europeans vulnerable to Russian demands on, in other areas. Uh, when it comes to security policy, military policy, foreign policy, and, and other issues. Uh, there is a lot of talk about something called the energy weapon, uh, meaning essentially the idea that Russia could use gas supplies to coerce Euro select European governments into something they don't want to do. Um, this talk about the energy weapon has resurfaced in the context of Ukraine and the events there uh, in 2014. Uh, first, uh, the annexation of Crimea. Second, obviously, those little green men popping up somewhere in, in the east of the country. Uh, and, and that idea about the energy weapon and vulnerabil vulnerability, you know, it extends to all of Eastern Europe more generally. Uh, there is um, um, most of the European countries in the east are very much dependent on Russian gas. These are countries that um, that would be dependent to the effect of anything between 65% to 100 on Russian gas imports. Some of them literally simply have one single source, like Bulgaria, and that's exactly why the US has started to be concerned about Russian uh, energy dependence of, of countries like Bulgaria, but that's not, a, not only the only country. Poland has been very vocal when it comes to Russian gas supplies. Um, we're talking about roughly, depending on how you count it, a third to 50% of, of imports, uh, of overall uh, consumption, and, and more than 60, 65% of imports coming from Russia. And debates about that have, have intensified with a new government that's more on the, on the populist right um, and, and very, very skeptical of, of Russian energy policies. And then eventually, obviously, you know, uh, the further south you go, uh, Romania and elsewhere, that story remains the same. So you have all of Eastern Europe is essentially being uh, the focal point of, of a discussion about Russian gas and import dependence, and to what extent that import dependence might, uh, might extend into, uh, into um, Russian, Russia having a, an, an ability to, to um, to coerce those countries into things that they don't want to do. And, and then, obviously, a, a, you know, one of the, the turning points in that debate lately was, uh, was obviously uh, Crimea, what you see here is, is a little sign uh, saying, Dobro pajalvat Krim, so very welcome uh, on Crimea. It says that in Russian, with a Russian flag. Um, and, uh, and obviously, uh, the, the whole, um, the whole, all the events in 20, 2014 um, pertaining to Crimea, drove home, home the point that the, the geopolitics of the region um, have been reshaped, and energy has been a really big part of that, that uh, geopolitical debate in the region. Now, that's where we are. Russian import dependence, policy discourse in Europe and the US, when it comes to that dependence, um, lots of headaches around um, particularly not natural gas, less oil, but a lot, of, a lot of gas. Now, the next question is, is there, is there really kind of indication of whether Russia may indeed use energy for, for political purposes, the energy weapon, that famous gas weapon that people talk about? So what I did here is just very quickly, I had a look back 
you know, about 10 years of where we may find incidents and incidents with empirical evidence that foreign policy and energy policy have been intertwined. And there is a couple of incidents uh, when it comes to, to Russia. I mean, obviously, the most important one that everyone talks about is 2006 and 2009 in, in Ukraine when gas, gas supplies were cut off. We can dis debate whether that was Russia cutting it off or whether it was Ukraine essentially siphoning off um, gas cargoes that were destined for Europe, which is a very plausible way of, of, uh, of looking at things. But at the very end, it's not a technical question. It's not the question of whether someone siphoned off gas supplies or someone else cut it off. What, what happened is the whole event um, emerged after uh, a political shift in Ukraine towards the West, and anything that had been disputed already for a long time when it comes to pricing, volumes, contracts, how they were handled, essentially resurfaced the moment you had a new government in Kiev. That makes the whole thing a political issue, regardless of the technicalities. But it goes further. I mean, the moment uh, Saakashvili uh, came to power in Tbilisi, we had, um, in, the, in the winter of 2005, 2006, we had a gas, gas cutoff here in, in Georgia. I very much remember that because my wife was working in Tbilisi that moment, and I visited her, and it was pretty cold. Unfortunately, they, ha they have these hot springs there, and they really, really help. And so we, we were visiting the baths literally every day, and everyone else was. That was a party. But, so, but he had that. Then he had um, a couple of hiccups surrounding Turkmenistan, when at some point one of the pipelines transiting Turkmen gas into Russia blew up for some strange reason, and that was it for, for Turkmen gas imports into Russia. That, by the way, um, were imports that the Russians um, had contracted on a long-term basis because they were very, very busy buying up uh, available volumes in the Caspian region in order to prevent the Europeans to get it. So that was part of the story why all, all of a sudden had Turkmen gas getting into Russia. Now, the moment that wasn't profitable anymore for Russia for a whole bunch of reasons because the contracts weren't right, the prices weren't right, um, that, uh, that pipeline did blow up and did not come back. And until this very day, Turkmenistan does not export any gas into Russia anymore. But we had a whole bunch of other events as well. Um, for instance, in 2006, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Baltics, we had a, an incident involving the, um, um, a refinery called Mazieko Nafta, which the Poles wanted to buy and the Russians wanted to buy. It was Luke Oil, uh, a Russian oil company. And the, uh, the, uh, the refinery went to the Polish competitor in response, uh, responding to which Luke Oil cut off the supplies of oil to that refinery. So the refinery wasn't running for a couple of weeks. In the end, it wasn't a big deal because you can replace that oil. Oil is a fungible commodity. But it was very, very clear that there, there was, you know, um, it was a strong foreign policy agenda behind that, that bid for, for Mazie Kunafta and the very fact that the Russians didn't get it triggered a response. You even had incidents involving Belarus, an ally of, of Russia, it still is, in 2007, when, uh, uh, when Gazprom insisted on price increases, but Belarus didn't want to pay that. And in the end, Gazprom ended up um, uh, cutting Belarus of, of some of the, of the contracted volume. So the point is there, is, there is a pattern here. There is a pattern that, that involves energy, and, and there is some link to, to foreign policies. You, so you can't dispute that away. There is a pattern that we have seen for a couple of years, and that's exactly what started to worry people. Now, the next question then would be, how does that look like for particularly the East European and the European situation, if it is an issue, and if it is a geopolitical problem. And what I plotted here is essentially a, a whole bunch of, uh, of stats that I, um, that I think, yeah, I got from the OECD. Um, what you see here essentially is, is how dependent some of the countries are when it comes to Russian gas. The, the lighter the color, the less dependent. So the, the, the Spaniards are okay, uh, the Baltics are not, right? 
So anything that comes out here really kind of pretty red is, is above 75%. Um, this would be around, uh, you know, less than 50, and, and the Austrians and others in between, um, they're around, you know, between 50 and 75. So that's the situation. By the way, this is from 2012. It didn't change. And the reason why I'm, um, why I'm putting this out is simply because of that. The situation did not change. We still have, <clears throat> we still have a pattern that would put most of these European countries into a, a dependency ratio of 75% and above when it comes to the import portfolio. And that's exactly because of the contractual patterns and of the pricing um, mechanisms where the Russians have proved very, very flexible lately. So that's the background. Now, what can you do if you have such a situation? And the long and the short of it is, not very much, because if you look at what the EU can do as an actor, it can do a whole bunch of things, but whatever it can do has something to do with regulation. It is a regulatory state. It epitomizes the regulatory state. You know, the, the EU is not, is not a nation state like any other. It doesn't have a treasury. It doesn't have gunboats or tanks. It doesn't own. It cannot nationalize companies. I mean, all the things that you, would, you could do as a government in Washington or Brussels or in, 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 in London or wheresoever, that's essentially something the EU cannot do. There's only one thing the EU can really, really do, and that's use regulation. But that it can do very well, because the EU has set this up for a long, long, long time, essentially since the 1950s. So if you cannot, you know, if you can't send tanks and gunboats and can't own companies and cannot kind of, you know, find other ways that national, that nation states would, would typically have at, at their disposal. But if you're in charge of energy security and particularly the, the energy market in the European Union, what you do is you work with what you have. And that's exactly what, what the EU has done. Now this is really interesting because that's where regulation all, all of a sudden becomes part of a, a broader geopolitical game. And the argument that I'm going to put forward here is it's not a bad tool if you, if you use it properly. And the EU has, I think, found a way to do that. Now, the first thing you want to do if you're a regulatory state is you want to do what you're supposed to do. If you're the European Union, you're in charge of what? Well, creating markets and making them work. That's, that's what, your, what your job is. Nothing else. How do you create markets? Well, first of all, you put in place the infrastructure. The situation the Europeans came from was a situation where you had, you know, 28, now 28 different markets, individual markets, national markets. They all had their own um, market regulators. They had their own companies. They were very much detached from each other. There was ver very little trade going on across borders. Pricing patterns were different. Um, but most importantly, there was simply no physical way of shipping molecules from A to B, if need be, across borders and, and the European Union. The European Union, uh, the, the Commission particularly, and the Commission was instrumental here, they, they, they started to change this. They, were put, they put out um, a whole bunch of, of programs, including one that's really important called the Projects of Common Interest. So what they, what they did is they, they identified strategically important infrastructure projects that would allow molecules to flow freely from A to B. So the idea essentially was very simple. Let's make gas like oil, right? Let's make sure that we can, gas, we, we can treat gas the way we treat it in oil. We can price it effectively, and we can ship it from A to B effectively. For that, you need to have infrastructure. So that involves a whole bunch of interconnectors. Um, reverse flow capacity between various different countries, interconnectors between countries that have not been uh, that have not been connected before, very long interconnectors, including, for instance, uh, here what, what we call the, the vertical corridor between uh, southeastern Europe and uh, and the Austrian hub in, in Baumgarten. You have a whole bunch of projects uh, connecting um, pivotal. Uh, producer regions, including Norway, with adjacent countries, here Sweden, and further on into, 
into the European mainland. Plus, there is a whole bunch of projects that would actually even try and diversify uh, the sources and routes. I mean, one of the most important ones is this, uh, the TANAP and TAP pipeline that would bring Azeri gas from the Shach Deniz II field all the way through Georgia into Turkey, further into, into southeastern Europe, and then ending up in Italy. So what you have here essentially is a market-making pro market project. The idea being markets work only if they're integrated, if they're competitive, if molecules can flow freely, plus if they can compete with each other across borders, plus additional sources help as well. So that's exactly what the so Southern Corridor, as it's called, comes in and maybe a whole bunch of other projects. In addition, you want to think about non-pipeline related sources of molecules. And that's exactly where liquefied, liquefied natural gas, LNG, comes in. So LNG, uh, LNG became a huge part of, of, the, uh, of the EU strategy and, and of the infrastructure priorities here. So what you see is all these dots, these blue dots. These are existing infrastructure uh, LNG projects and, and some of them are already in place. And then you have additional ones in red plus, um, plus pipelines connecting those additional LNG terminals with important grids. You have that in, in Croatia. You have that in, uh, down there in, uh, in Greece. Now you have one planned in Cyprus. You have one planned now in operation actually in, in Poland, one up here in Estonia, and so on and so forth. So the whole idea being, from the perspective of a regulatory state of the European Commission that's in charge of making markets and creating markets and making them work, the whole idea being the more imports and the more sources and the more options you have, the more option optionality you have, the better for that market creation project. This was not primarily um, an issue of, oh, we want to wean ourselves off Russian gas. No, it was a market creation type of project. Because the idea was the more effectively the internal market worked, that huge market, that, that 450 BCM market, the more resilient the system would be against supply shocks. And that worked pretty well. Most of these projects are in place right now or are being built. And over the course of the last 10, 15 years, a little bit less, maybe 10 years, uh, most of these, these interconnectors have at least, uh, le at least left the planning stage and are being implemented, particularly in crucial parts of Europe uh, and where in areas where uh, Russian import dependence is, is, is highest. There are some problems there, I'll come back to them a little bit later, particularly when it comes to Eastern Europe, but most of that is on track. The Commission has also, um, they have primarily uh, thought about this in terms of facilitating the regulatory aspect um, of those pipelines. They threw some money at it, but very often that was money that was geared towards um, uh, looking at the planning stages, making sure you get um, the, uh, the environmental impact assessments and everything that you need to pave the way for the major investment to happen. But there's something else that the European Commission did, and, and it was very, very important. In addition to the hardware, they essentially thought about the software. These are terms that, that the Energy Commissioner, Sefcovic, would use. So these are not my terms, but I think it very much kind of depicts of what, what, what the Commission was about, or was after. So essentially, it's a big book called EU Energy Law. Uh, and the idea here is very simple. Hardware in place is all right, but unless you make sure you have the regulatory frameworks in place conducive to really making those markets work, the infrastructure won't, won't suffice and won't, won't make those molecules fl flow from A to B. So that big, big book consists essentially, essentially of three what they call energy packages. I just focus on the, thir focus on the third one. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a couple of things that get a little bit technical, but there's a couple of things that are really important. Uh, one of them is that the, the regulatory bid here focuses on essentially unbundling infrastructure ownership from energy services. So in the old days, what you would do is you would contract a lot of gas from some external partner, for instance, the Russians, then you would 
based on that long-term contract, you would build the infrastructure, you would put a lot of money into the ground, sink investments, and because you have sunk investments and because you have long-term contracts, you use that infrastructure in order to amortize your, 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 uh, your investment and to service your market, which means you, you do it all yourself. You do the contracts, you do the infrastructure, and you operate the infrastructure. Now, in the new world, that's, that's gone. You can't operate the infrastructure whilst owning the, the, the molecules going through it. So you separate all of this, which in the end is nothing else than, um, than an effort to create competition in that market. Now, at the same time, you want to make sure that even if someone owns the infrastructure, um, then he or she cannot restrict other parties from using that infrastructure. That's where third-party access comes in. So TPA provisions became important to, uh, to give access to, to you know, competitor companies to supply gas to European consumers through existing infrastructure. And then there's a whole bunch of other um, elements coming in, including a set of policies on, on uh, security of supply regulation. Most importantly, a, uh, um, the, the, the Commission has now uh, put themselves in a, in, a, in a position where they can vet long-term contracts. So they essentially look at every single existing bilateral long-term contract between individual countries or or companies, and even retroactively vet them with a view to unbundling requirements, third-party access, and all the rest of it. So essentially, they start to turn the whole model upside down, a long-term contract model in, of the past with very kind of rigid uh, contractual terms had or started to give way to a, a much more flexible model where the Russians would still have their 100 or whatever BCM, 130 BCM in the market, but they now have to trade that gas on very, very, very different terms. Now, what you get if you, um, uh, if you have that, well, you get a situation where you've got to enforce it as well, and that's exactly where, where some of the, um, the, the, the really prominent figures of the European Commission come in, and that's um, uh, Mrs. Vestager, uh, uh, the, uh, the competition commissioner, a really important figure uh, in the EU. There's actually, not sure you're into, uh, uh, into, into uh, into series, but there is a series, a European series called Borgen. It's, it's, a, it's a crime series, and uh, it's about a Danish prime minister um, being involved in fighting um, for, for a whole bunch of causes. The point is, she's from Denmark, she's a prime minister. Rumors are that that series is really modeled after her. It tells you a lot about who she is and what she does. She's tough. Um, she has taken on Gazprom for their dominant position on the European market by way of launching an antitrust inquiry. That's unprecedented so far. So essentially the idea is, again, you go back to the regulatory state, the toolbox, and you say, look, we can't do very much about Russia, uh, we can't do very much about Gazprom as a geopolitical actor, if you will, as an actor that might get a call from the Kremlin and get instructions if that exists, or if, if that really happens, that's a different story. But what we can do is we can treat it as any other actor on the European market. If it has a dominant position, well, we have competition and antitrust laws. We take them on based on those antitrust laws. And that's exactly what they did. So they launched um, a whole bunch of dawn raids in 2013. Based on that, launched uh, across Europe in, in all Gazprom offices. Uh, and based on that, they launched against uh, an antitrust inquiry that just uh, actually delivered a result uh, a couple of, of months ago uh, where you had a deal um, which essentially, to cut a very, very long story short, does away with the business model of old. Because Prom can no longer uh, exclusively service certain markets. It can no longer do this on a long-term contractual basis. It can no longer um, um, partition markets by, by way of using um, certain clauses that would uh, forbid reselling gas, and so on and so forth. So at the very end, um, again, the regulatory state toolbox. Is Gazprom the only one? No. I mean, obviously not. You know, that's, that's the same person with a different ant antitrust inquiry. So she took on the big guys. She took on Google, Amazon. We had Microsoft before. That wasn't her. That was her predecessor. But the point is, it's a key tool in that big toolbox to go after the big guys. And it works. It delivers. So whatever you think about Gazprom as an actor, whether it's a company or not, or, you know, 
whatever you think it is, it doesn't really matter. If you look at this through the lens of a competition commissioner and through the lens of a regulatory state actor, if you look at this through the lens of, of, of regulation, if you will, you just hit them over the head with a big regulatory stick and it hurts and they have to do something else and, and change their, their behavior. And that's exactly what the commission did. Now, does it deliver? I would argue it does. I mean, if, if you look at, uh, uh, at uh, the effects of, of you know, of, of that hardware and that software combined, what you get is essentially the old model, which is the, the oil price peg, long-term contractual relationship being on the way out. And it gives way to a lot more competition on the market. So the gray box here, that's hub pricing. Back in, just 10 years ago, we had very little hub pricing, something that you know in the US for a long, long time. You know, if you look at, if you want to know what, what the gas price is, you look at Henry Hub. That didn't exist until very recently, or a similar pricing mechanism did not exist in Europe until very, very recently. Uh, and, and so, hub pricing is on the way in, the old price pack is on the way out, and a lot more flexibility and liquidity is injected into the market. On top of that, you have a whole bunch of other things still at play. Some governments still like the idea of regulating prices, and they do. The further east you go and the further southeast you go, you still have a lot of regulated prices. <coughs> the further northwest you go, the, the higher the liquidity of markets, the more integrated they are, and, and the more hot price they are. So there are patterns depending on where you are in Europe. But from a 10,000 view perspective, this is what you get, and this, I would argue, is good news for European energy security. Because what, in the end, what, what you get is a situation where molecules compete with molecules. It doesn't really matter where they come from. They're priced competitively. And if something goes funny, for instance, Russia cutting off gas, there is additional supplies from elsewhere because that, that supply shortage will translate into price incentives. Price incentives will trigger um, su supply responses. That's what we call energy security. Now, on top of that, what you get is greater resilience. This is from colleagues at EWI, uh, research, Energy Research Institute. What they did is they modeled um, the effects of a supply shock to the Commission, uh, to, the, to the European Union, uh, over, over the course of a couple of months. And that supply shock would be 100% um, uh, supply shock from Russia. So essentially the assumption is from day one to day two, the Russian gas is gone. And what you have is within, within the first month, not very much in terms of, of effect. The further, um, the, the, the longer it, it, it lasts, the higher the effects. This is three months, Poland will be affected, um, but most other countries in the East won't. Interesting here, uh, interestingly here, uh, the, the Baltics won't be affected at all. That's a function of, um, of a new uh, uh, LNG terminal called uh, Independence, which is really interesting. We brought them online maybe a year ago. It's a what is it, four and a half, five BCM import terminal. Um, and that compares to a market in the region of six, maybe. So that's, that's a good insurance policy. But, and then it takes you literally kind of nine months until Europe is affected, as it was uh, before the hardware and the software came into place. So that's, a, that's the good news. You get new pricing structures and you get more resilience. And I would argue this, the, we've got a long, long way. Are we out of the woods? No, we aren't. I mean, obviously, there's a whole bunch of other things that, that, um, that, can be, that still can be done to that system, and I think we can do this um, a little bit later uh, during, to, during the Q&A. Now, the big question here, obviously, is because we're in the US, where does LNG come in here, particularly US LNG? And my point would be, it is part of that whole conundrum, but, a little bit, but think a little bit about it as, as an insurance policy, and that has something to do with prices. And what I plotted here is essentially a very kind of stylized uh, pricing structure of, of US LNG, where you get a Henry Hub of maybe $3. Then you get, you get a, you know, some transport and liquefaction costs, which means your, your long run marginal costs would run at maybe $7. That's, that's the price that you have, have to get in Europe. Now, if you compare that to the German import price, that's the Russian gas price, the long term Russian gas price at the moment. Um, we're talking about $5 there, and, and the NBP, the, the, the national balance point in, in London, which is the marker for gas, 
uh, in, in Europe, you know, it's, it's not a million miles off that. Which means US LNG might find it difficult unless you really talk short-term, sorry, uh, sh uh, short run marginal cost and, and unless you really kind of consider infrastructure investment as, as, as sunk. Then um, US LNG might actually come in as uh, on a very competitive or at least competitive uh, basis. So the point is, the US LNG will not save the Europeans. It will not come to the rescue of Europe. But it will obviously have an effect the moment something happens to European prices, for instance, due to a supply shock, because it will happen, it will translate into a price signal that will attract additional supplies in the shape of US LNG, LNG and other LNG. Um, and that's essentially, again, a function of of that market, market creation, market making project. Now, there is a little bit of, of, um, of an element that I still want to discuss beyond you know, the idea that you get quite far if you just create markets and try and make them work. Um, because you can think about regulation also in very strategic terms. And, and this is where we get a little bit into, let's say, interesting territory. What the EU, EU has done is they have not only kind of created their internal market, which is that blue market here, that's the EU gas market. They have also started to strategically export their regulatory regime to adjacent countries, and that's particularly those yellow countries here in the shape of the energy community. The energy community is, a, is essentially a vehicle, an international organization sitting in Vienna um, that negotiates with countries adjacent to the EU. At the moment, those countries become part of the energy community, uh, they have to adopt the entire key, that thick book of energy regulation uni unilaterally and effectively become part of the EU energy regime. Now, that can be positive for those countries, particularly if you sit somewhere down here in, in Southeastern Europe, because having, having access to the bigger market might give you um, some benefits. Uh, if you play according to the, their rules, that gives pl planning security to, to companies, investors, and all the rest of it. Not a bad idea. But particularly with a view to Ukraine, which, which has been one of the sources of, 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 of or a big headache for, uh, for European imports, because a lot of Russian gas still transits through Ukraine, that becomes a really interesting geopolitical issue. Because the moment Ukraine subscribes to the energy community and becomes part of that, they actually have to totally remodel their domestic energy sector, and that's exactly what they have started to do. So they have started to th think about um, uh, partial privatization, at least, of, of the national energy sector, uh, of the national energy company, it didn't get very far. Um, so far, they, they, uh, the um, unbundling requirements, their party access requirements, and all the rest of it, they have now started to become part of, of Ukrainian energy law. And that's really interesting because what it gives you is a situation where um, whatever, on whatever terms Russian gas comes through Ukraine, there is no way whatsoever you can, you can now try and, if you're the Russians, tinker with infrastructure and molecules um, because the rules uh, are, no long, are such that you A, have to separate delivery from, from service, um, and second, the, the jurisdiction, if you will, doesn't sit in Ukraine anymore. It sits here in Brussels because that's essentially the, uh, um, the authority deciding over uh, EU energy regulation. That's a pretty smart, I would argue, geopol geopolitical move if you think about you know, rules export and regulation. Still, we're talking about very soft toolbox, right? We're not talking about tool, you know, gunboats and tanks and all the rest of it. We're talking about regulation, right? But it, it has something... Um, there is there's something in this that, that has a very strong uh, geopolitical effect, which gets me into maybe two final points I want to make here. Uh, there is a tendency here, just to go back a little bit to, to our energy com uh, to our uh, competition commissioner, there, li there is a little bit of a tendency here to think about, and that's, that's something that started to you know, emerge the last couple of years only, to think a little bit about the regulatory state box as you know, as a tool in a ge geoeconomic game. And the reason why I'm saying this is because um, the commission, now very much empowered uh, to use energy regulation uh, domestically, but also when it comes to exporting those rules, 
they have started to think about the selective application of those rules. And that's really where, where things get, get very, very hairy, right? Um, that's what, what prompted a, a bunch of observers, including um, Keith Johnson here from Foreign Policy, to talk, to talk about the bureaucrats of war. You know, if you don't have those gunboats and tanks and all the rest of it, you know, you resort to something else in order, in order to, to solve geopolitical problems. And the argument here is, and I very much agree with that, that, um, that all of a sudden, you know, those, those, it's not little green men, it's little gray men, you know, those bureaucrats in Brussels have started to take that role. And, and there is a whole bunch of, of examples um, that I could cite here, I'll just take a few, that suggest that we're really getting into a, a somewhat difficult territory here. It's, very, it's a, very way, a very selective and targeted way to think about regulation. If you think about South Stream, a pipeline that was sponsored by Russia and was supposed to bring in 60 plus BCM of Russian gas across um, the, the Black Sea into Bulgaria, further on into Southeastern Europe. A big project, very much to the, to, to the disliking of, of, of Brussels and, and, and some, some officials in, in, in European capitals. Uh, what the European Commission did is um, they objected to procurement of, of that pipeline. So essentially, they essentially said, look, Oh, wonderful, you bought that bunch of steel, but guess what? It wasn't according to EU rules uh, when it comes to procurement policies. And yeah, you can have those, you know, those pipes and that bunch of steel, but unfortunately, you cannot use it to, uh, to build your pipeline, which means in the end, they killed the project. Now, you can argue with that, but the point is, it was a very selective way of thinking about that one project, because in other projects, they didn't have the same concerns, and there were similar projects. Um, think about Nabucco. The Boko project that would rival South Stream, South Stream, you know, being the Russian project through the Black Sea, Nabucco being um, a rival project going through Turkey into, into Southeastern Europe, essentially trying to service and serve the same market. Now, Nabucco had a whole bunch of issues that South Stream had as well, including third party access issues and all the rest of it. What did, what did the commission do? Because Nabucco was sponsored and very much favored by Western uh, governments, including the US government, they invented a rule that said, look, yes, TPA is important, but we just exempt you. Because this time around, we really think these are the good molecules, and we would like to have them. And you have a whole bunch of other examples. For instance, Article 11 of, of um, the third uh, energy package now even entails what people have dubbed a Gazprom clause. So essentially, it doesn't say that's a problem, but what it says, look, if you're a company that is dominant in some market, has, has a headquarter in Moscow and starts with G, you know, uh, we might take issue with that. Okay, I'm making, I'm making, you know, I'm overdoing things a little bit, but the point is, you know, they, there, is, there is a tendency to single out companies, and that even extends now to a very controversial project, the Nord Stream 2 project, which is a Russian pipeline project across the Baltic Sea all the way into Germany that would bring about 50 BCM of additional gas into the EU. Here, the commission has, uh, has now found themselves in a position where they argue, well, you know, we can't do very much about external kind of non-EU projects, but what we can do is we can say, look, um, EU, EU law doesn't stop at EU borders. It also applies in the Baltic Sea. So please, Gazprom, you want to build Nord Stream 2? Can you make sure we have third party access somewhere in the Baltic Sea? That, that obviously would kill the project if that goes through. So the point really is, what we're having here is, um, we're having a situation where we're talking about regulation not necessarily as, um, as something that comes with the, the objective of market creation. It, it comes with a smack of a strategy and strategic regulation, and I think this is, this is a slippery slope because regulation is there for making markets make them work. It should be neutral, and it should not kind of serve strategic foreign policy goals. So I think we're at a, at a point where, you know, we really need to think carefully about how to go forward with, with you know, that toolbox. So far, it has worked well. I think it has, it has made 
Europe and the European Union a more resilient place. I think it has, it has contributed a lot to more competitive pricing. I think it has given consumers a lot of, of consumer benefit. But, um, but now there is a tendency <clears throat> to kind of to go into strategic geo geoeconomic territory. And, and um, the latest move of the commission, uh, which is you know, the new big grand energy project called the Energy Union, uniting all these various policies in the, <clears throat> in the union uh, from energy to climate to environment, uh, it, it sets broader goals now, and including strong energy security goals that might at some point uh, even inform the way you think about regulation. And I'm, I'm not so sure that's a great idea. Uh, we just have a book out on, uh, on the energy union. We, we call the energy union uh, a liberal mercantilist project, you know, one that comes with a strong, you know, with a strong liberal paradigm behind it, but with a strong mercantilist smack, you know, a strategic use of your toolbox whenever you need it, you know, separating good molecules from bad molecules, or just doing something else. So maybe that's exactly where I finish, and I leave it at that. Maybe with a positive notion of, of yes, I think we look a lot better than, than we have looked. We, me personally, now the EU uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, the EU is not out of the woods yet, but, uh, but um, there is a lot less that Russian molecules can do uh, to EU energy security than, than people might think. So that energy weapon is, is not blunt, but it's a lot le less powerful than it has been. So thank you very much for your <laughs> attention. I'm actually going to make a comment. It reminds me an awful lot about Len Lease and the Japanese response and, the <laughs> and some of the other responses to Len Lease and whether that was a, you know, an aggressive <laughs> kind of a policy. Anyway, so who would like to go first? Sure. Okay, Rob. Yeah. Is that the bigger picture? <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm the economist, so I have no picture. <laughs> so thank you first for a really great talk. Um, learned a lot. Um, we don't. I think, well, there's a real tendency here to think about energy markets in Europe too simply, right? Mm -hmm. So we tend to think of access and, and very simple things like, oh, if you have a problem with Russia, build the southern pipeline corridor, um, as if that, you know, and that'll solve it. And, and you did a really nice job of, of kind of talking about the complexity. I guess um, my reaction to this is, you know, and granted an American view, is what you called um, regulation uh, and what you outlined as the regulatory state. Um, ironically, here we would have called deregulation, right? So um, in the United States, what you're talking about, third-party access, unbundling, um, the one layer we don't have really is energy security in the sense of concerns that somebody might cut us off. Um, what we call energy security, you would call resilience. And so uh, it was interesting to see that kind of put together. And I guess my question for you, um, this is cast in the, in the idea of, of energy security, but um, how much was the liberalization of markets really just for that and really a byproduct is that you end up with a more resilient system that can also discipline an actor that is maybe prone or you're concerned about bad behavior. So. so I think I should just join. Yeah, did, did you want? Yeah. Yeah. I have uh, very similar questions. That's why I thought it might be better if we, we just talk at the same time. I mean, when we talk about security, people have a knee-jerk reaction to think about gunboats, as you said. Mm -hmm. But of course, military ha is a very limited, uh, has very limited use. It, it is a cudgel 
Uh, and sometimes it, it helps a lot to talk something out or have a regulation. I mean, so I always use the example for my students that you're angry at your sibling and you draw that line, uh, of, you know, right in the middle of the, of the room, right? You know, remember that when you hate that and my stuff's on one side and the other stuff's on the other. Uh, you know, you could shoot your sibling. I mean, I mean that is what genocide basically is, right? If uh, this is also the the solution that you heard with Hitler, if you've got ten percent unemployment, ten percent Jews, get rid of the Jews, your your problem solved. Bullets are very cheap, but they're so messy, right? Uh, and then in the end, they really don't have the utility. I'm, you can tell I'm being very. I mean, let's not even talk about human costs and just the utility. It's messy. It's not going to work. And that's when you start to negotiate with your sibling. And then you have regulation. You draw the line down the middle of the room to try to figure out what the problem is. So this is just this is just what we talk about diplomacy. We we really have to think of security in a in a very large way uh, to to create some sort of of environment where you can actually get along. Because in the end, uh, war just isn't an option. And I think we see this when it's coming from the Russians anyway. Uh, they're not taking, uh, I mean, you do have skirmishes, uh, certainly with, uh, with Ukraine. They took over Crimea. But mostly what you were having was, let's turn off the gas, different. You had cyber warfare in Estonia. So you had uh, so the idea of operations other than war. You had other kinds of ways of, of getting their point across. Uh, so I thought, I, 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 the economist once said that the way the European Union will become a superpower is through its administration and regulation. And I thought that this talk just fit in perfectly with that. And I was, I was really thrilled. Uh, you said it'd be scary. I felt you gave us hope, actually. I felt, uh, I felt so pleased that there was something that the EU could do. And what I thought, going into Rob's point, is that it really felt, it really fit into the power of liberalism. And I don't mean liberal here in the, in the idea of, of, you know, sort of American politics at all, but the idea that free speech and free markets will allow for, uh, for the better running of, of the world. And this can be, uh, this can be in terms of, um, you know, of liberalizing just what Rob said, you know, deregulation, if you will, a different way that makes it difficult to, uh, makes it difficult to, to have the, the Russians really control things. And uh, so that was a question of mine. And so I have two issues. One is this intentionality issue. And I'm not sure, and I just don't know the answer, how intentional was it from the beginning, let's say, to have regulation as a way to control the Russians here? Because what I think it could be, and I don't know, is that it's happy happenstance. And what I mean by that is that the Europeans have been regulating for a very long time. Uh, so I wouldn't be, I, I, I wouldn't think it was so much like, I know, let's create this whole energy, you know, to try to stop the Russians. I have a feeling it was one of those things that the Europeans were doing and said, hey, this is a way that we can actually, um, you know, make this work in our favor. Now, at the end, you brought up a moral judgment where you said markets should be neutral. And I always have trouble with the should. Uh, markets are what they are. Markets are manipulated all the time. The whole idea of both regulation and deregulation is to try to keep them functioning in as neutral a way as, as possible. But they're, they're always manipulated. It's the same issue with free speech. Speech should be free, but we can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Right? The Supreme Court came down with that. You have to have some regulation on free speech. Uh, so I'm not so convinced by the, uh, by the moral aspect. Um, uh, a wise person here, Michael Horan, if you remember uh, him, he used to teach con law here. Uh, I told him we couldn't legislate morality when I was a young ABD. And he said, what do you mean? We do it all the time. Look at the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder. Right? Thou shalt not kill. And so for me, I have trouble with this intentionality, the, the idea that, um, that these should be something and that the EU is, is using them in a way that they shouldn't. Uh, I think there are two ways to think of it. One, if they are using it and this is a great way to keep them freer, I'm like, all power to them. I really don't have a problem. Uh, if the other, the other idea is that if liberalism, the idea of free markets, the, the way that you should be able to vent your concerns, and that's the way to have a better, that's the, the whole idea of the core liberal democracies, and they're working within it, I don't have a problem that way uh, also. So just some thoughts. Thank you. Maybe I can just add a little bit to that. I had one question and was waiting for Stephanie to kind of put it there, which is, um, the second question, so the first point we both are kind of agreed on is the, the idea of liberalization um, and the role of markets. Um, I do, I think between Stephanie and I, I kind of agree maybe more with Andreas that this manipulation of markets, certainly there are manipulations of markets, but you may undermine, if 
the first goal or an equal goal was liberalization of markets for the benefits of, of, of market outcomes versus mm -hmm. strict regulation in the sense of old national companies and lack of access, et cetera, uh, higher prices in the end of the day. Uh, creating that uncertainty of how markets will work could actually undermine the market mechanism. So I think that's what you're arguing exactly. about. But the second question I'd have is really, uh, and maybe this is a byproduct as well, um, we didn't hear much in your talk about the joint dependence that there is mm -hmm. here. So while Europe is very dependent on Russia, at the same time, Russia's main export market is Europe. Uh, it's certainly the case that Europe will hurt a lot more in the short term if Russia turns off the gas, but in the long run, if that creates a reaction that moves Europe away from purchasing Russian gas, um, Russia is absolutely dependent on their energy sector, right, with 25% of GDP from energy and, and a lot of that from the gas sector. So I think, again, you're absolutely right, this, this regulatory mechanism also, it, it's, it's neat in that it doesn't push too far, and, and yet, and, but it leans, puts the thumb on the scale just enough to get the outcome that you want. So, so again, I, I appreciate the way you've kind of presented that nuance, which is, which is something that, you know, we don't, uh, what I opened with is in the United States, we tend to just get the big pick, you know, the big items and we don't see the nuances. So again, thank you. Okay, and then super, <laughs> super quick, why, was, why were Romania and Bulgaria seemingly isolated from, they, they didn't seem to be so affected, I was curious. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions and great comments. Um, I think we, we absolutely agree on, 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 on most points. But maybe I can use this, uh, this response just to quickly clarify a few things a little bit further. I mean, first of all, uh, maybe let's start with, with the energy islands in, in Southeastern Europe, Romania, Bulgaria. Uh, and and um, and the situation there. The, the point is, those have been countries that have been very much disconnected from other parts of, of Eastern Europe, and uh, that was both by coincidence, simply because there hasn't been a lot of um, um, you know infrastructure being put in place during communist times, and Romania has been a producer uh, that that very much was self-sufficient and didn't export very much. Bulgaria, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, didn't, didn't put in place any infrastructure to neighboring countries. But, but it was also by choice. Uh, and by choice, that's where things become, become a little bit more difficult. Uh, by choice in the sense that um, there is a lot of adverse incentives still at play in those countries uh, for not applying EU regulation, for not responding to, to, uh, to directives coming out of Brussels, for bluntly kind of ignoring uh, the market-making project. And that has something to do with incumbents domestically. Just for the sake of the argument, Bulgaria is home to a wonderful company called uh, Bulgaria Energy Holding, which is 100% state-owned, and they own 100% of a wonderful company called Bulgar Gas, which is uh, the vehicle that sits on 100% of the contracts with the Russians and has no interest whatsoever in changing anything um, going forward because they make juicy profits with this and as an incumbent and a monopolist, I mean, that's textbook economics 101, right? <laughs> Last thing you want to do is change because you have, uh, you, you run monopoly rents and, and on top of that, uh, what you have is a situation where um, uh, politicians can use those wonderful ve vehicles to make a whole bunch of cronies happy, you know, to, to, make, this, to make this very blunt uh, as a statement here. And so, there is, there is a lot of that going on in Eastern Europe across the board, Bulgaria and Romania just being some of the, the more prominent cases. Uh, we have seen some countries in Eastern Europe actually going the other way lately, going a more economic nationalist uh, 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 direction. The Hungarians have just nationalized, renationalized their energy companies. It was a well-run oil company, actually, Mol. Now it is no longer. Um, there is... Um, uh, there is talks in, in Poland to bring the energy sector on, uh, under state control 100% again. It already is state control to a large, large extent. So the point is that pendulum is swinging back, and that's exactly where choice comes in. It's not only about, you know, fate. It's, it's literally about policy choices that those countries have taken in the past and are taking right now as we speak. 
So that's a little bit of an issue still because, and it actually is a big issue because um, if at some point the, 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 whole, the whole mechanism that I described, you know, the, the hardware, the software and all of this does not deliver, it's not necessarily because it's a bad mechanism, but simply because some countries deliberately choose to go a different pathway. And if some countries do that, the entire system is less resilient. And that's, I think, a, a big problem. But maybe quickly on, on, on the intentionality, uh, was there a master plan? No, there wasn't. There was no one sitting abroad. I mean, those, those little gray men, they, they might be smart, but you know, there's, bureaucrats don't think that way, right? They're not kind of geostrategic animals and go like, okay, we've got a problem with the Russians. Can we please use regulation in a way that actually we, we can do away with that problem? This is not how it went. Um, I think there's, there's two things that were at work. One is um, essentially the, the commission has a mission and that mission is, is ingrained in the DNA of, of the European Union. You know, it is a market-making project from the very beginning because the idea was essentially, you know, uh, if, we integrated mar if we integrate markets, particularly in, in, in sectors that were used to wage war, coal, steel, that's exactly where the, where the European comes from, Union comes from, then chances are the French, the Germans, the Brits, and all of them won't go to war against each other anymore. So essentially, the high authority, which now is the commission, has that one mission and one mission only, which is market making and market creation, integration. So that's one. But the second is this good old mission creep. You know, uh, that's what bureaucracies do. You know, they start in one place and then they kind of, you know, they spread into other areas. And then, you know, the first thing the, the commission found was the telecommunication sector, then the postal services, and then they went into transport and they went to a whole bunch of things. And in the end, they found the energy sector, right? It's, it's, it's just, banal mission creep, um, a bureaucracy empowering itself, a byproduct of which, right, um, is more resilience in a system that was utterly non-resilient before. And, um, uh, but fine, <laughs> fine with me. You know, it, it delivers, and uh, it, it delivers a lot, not only resilience, but also consumer benefit, because that's what, what a well-functioning market does deliver. Um, Maybe a final point on, on uh, or maybe two final points. I think my point was really about regulation and, and not about markets being neutral. And, and the point really is, you know, the, a regulatory framework has one job and one job only, which is planning security. So it's about a certain set of rules that you put in place that give planning security to investors so that investors can put down quite a bit of money actually when it comes to the energy sector is one of the most capital intensive sectors that we have um, and is a sector with one of the largest lead times when it comes to investment and for that you need planning security. Now that's exactly why regulation needs to apply across the board because you don't want to single out good investment and separate it from bad investment or good molecules from bad molecules because the moment you do this investors might be disincentivized to, to, to put down the capital and the investment that's needed in order to build the very resilience that the system needs. And um, what I didn't talk about, but what's really important to, to note in that context is the whole debate about the energy union was not a debate about, um, about energy markets and climate and making the world a better place and all of that. It was a debate that was kick-started by Donald Tusk, the, the former Polish prime minister now um, president of, of uh, I always get this wrong, of the council. And he wrote a letter in the FT, I think in 2014, just in the wake of the Ukraine crisis and just in the wake of Russia chewing into Ukraine's territory. And his argument was, we have this 450 BCM market, it's the biggest import market in the world, we have regulation and what we can do essentially is we can bundle consumer power and, and use it to coerce Russia in light of the fact that they need that market to give us the deal that we want. Essentially what he was asking for is a purchase vehicle, a, mon a monopsony, um, which is exactly the opposite of what you want if you're after a liberal market making project, right? It would do away with exactly the stuff that I've been talking about before. But it would be about using your regulatory toolbox in very, very strategic and indeed in non-market uh, uh, terms and non for non-market purposes. So this is exactly where, where you get into a very, very 
dangerous territory. And, and obviously, we're not doing this, and a whole bunch of people have, you know, raised their, has to raise their hands and say, can we please stop that? And, you know, but still, we have, we have this debate out there, particularly in Eastern Europe. Uh, it's a debate that doesn't go away. And it, might, it is also a debate that very much resonates with the way they are thinking about their own energy sectors these days. Maybe a final word. Um, um, good old Brussels effect, right? You're totally right. I mean, this is, uh, it is amazing. And, 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 and regulation is something completely boring, but it's something that, that in the end is, is incredibly powerful. I mean, you know, uh, I think it was, it was Lavinex, or I don't know exactly who, who, which colleague it was, talking about the, the Brussels effect. And she, see, she essentially cited the example of, you know, of McDonald's Happy Meals, which in the US have only a certain type of toy, right? Um, and the reason why you have only a certain type of toy, which does not harm children, and a toy that children cannot swallow and do other things with, is very much due to the, uh, to, to the fact that Brussels at some point regulated the size of those toys, which now became standards on a global level. That's exactly why American kids have those wonderful Happy Meals. This is the Brussels effect. And it is, you know, what works for Happy Meals, it works exactly the same way for molecules. And this is, this is really interesting, and that's, that's exactly where, where that kind of stuff becomes so powerful and actually really interesting in, in geopolitical terms. So I'd like to open it up to any questions um, from the audience. And we have a mic that we will pass to you. So anybody have a question? Wait, wait, what? Please wait for the mic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you spoke about this very much in a European context, but gas is available elsewhere in the world, and th there's an Iranian component to this as well. Uh, I mean, what other options do the Europeans have if, if Putin, for instance, decides to, to, uh, to use the gas uh, uh, as, as a diplomatic tool uh, more fiercely than he's done already? Uh, I mean, the EU uh, has to be looking toward a future where Russia may be forced why in one of a number of reasons to, to be more aggressive and not wanting to be you know, so beholden to the Russians. So this is just very European right now. W what else can they do? Could you also comment on what we mean by aggression? So if you're Russian, yeah. how do you view this? And, and I'm wondering about triggers. Who triggered what in the context yeah. of Ukraine? OK. Um, that's a difficult but very interesting one. Maybe, maybe quickly going back to the question of what triggers what. Um, I think what we're talking about here is, is very often a matter of interpretation. I mean, the one thing you cannot argue with is whether molecules are there. If they aren't, they aren't, right? But what we had in 2009, for the sake of the argument, was a situation where in January, during a very, very cold winter, um, the Russian gas stopped flowing through Ukraine. And what it meant was that countries further down the line, Bulgaria, Slovakia, you know, countries in East Europe, literally came to a standstill. The socio-economic life came to a standstill. The feedstock wasn't there for, for industry. Um, the heating wasn't there for households, the electricity wasn't there, um, and uh, so essentially, and it, it lost, it, it, those countries lost a certain percentage points of the GDP, and that's empirical. Now, that's what we can all agree on. What the Russians would argue is that um, what, you cr what triggered that cut was the fact that Ukraine had not delivered on its contracts. So there were, um, cert there were certain agreements in place that were on a price of gas and on contracted volumes that the Ukraine would take off from Russia, plus additional volumes going through Ukraine destined for Europe. Now, the Russians said that, A, Ukraine piled up a lot of debt because they didn't pay their bills, and that's probably right. And second, um, they 
took off more gas than contractually they were allowed to, <clears throat> which caused the Russians to stop exactly the amounts that were destined for Ukraine and only let through and only deliver the volumes that were destined for Europe. Now the Russians, sorry, Ukrainians at that point, because it was a cold winter, continued using gas, but that was not their gas, it was gas that was supposed to go to Europe because at that moment still 50% of Russian gas were transiting through Ukraine gas that would go to Europe, as a reaction to which Russia stopped gas supplies altogether. Now, who's to blame? This is, it is very complicated. Um, obviously, there is a, a broader political context, and I alluded to that, which is a change in government in Kiev before, and the Maidan protest, uh, sorry, the, uh, the um, 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 what is that? I always get my colored revolutions wrong, a colored revolution. Orange revolution, yes, I always get them wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and that provided for you know, the political context of this. But technically speaking, the Russians had a point, and a very good one. So was that aggression? Was that an energy weapon? Or was that essentially just enforcing um, a, a, contractual, uh, you know, a, a contractual agreement? That's very much subject to debate. And I'm not saying I agree with what happened. I'm just saying it's really, really difficult to say, look, in this context, we have an energy weapon at play. It's just complicated. Now, the question would then be whatever, whatever the, the interpretation is, at the very end, the molecules aren't there, what, what options do the Europeans have? I think there's a whole bunch of options they have, have, options they have right now. Um, because of, of, of the hardware exercise, there's a lot of storage um, that hasn't been there before. We have a security supply regulation that now obliges European countries to store gas for a number of days of consumption. Um, there is additional import capacity just for the sake of the argument. The Europeans now sit nominally on 216, I think was the latest number, BCM of, of LNG import capacity. Um, that's, that compares to 140 BCM of Russian gas imports. So nominally, they could nominally, they could replace Russian gas tomorrow uh, with, with LNG imports. Obviously, that will not happen. A, LNG is more uh, expensive. Second, the terminals aren't where they are needed. And there's still not an, the necessary infrastructure to get that LNG gas, that re regasified gas, across um, several borders into the places that might be hit most. Um, so what else is there? Well, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, about East Mediterranean gas, um, the Zohar fields uh, of, of, of uh, offshore Egypt, Tamar, Leviathan, other fields that might or might not, not Leviathan is being developed in, in the East Med, but these, these are pipe dreams so far. There's not much going on because the economics aren't there, the markets aren't there, the regulation is there, uh, and the countries in the region can't get their acts together when it comes to export regimes. Um, Iran, not really, an issue, not really a, a, a player so far uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but but mostly I would argue for domestic reasons. I think the Iranians will very much want to use a lot of the gas that they're producing for, for domestic economic purposes, not necessarily for exporting that. They might, might want to use it for, um, uh, for creating products of added value in, in the petrochemical sector and elsewhere. Um, so, so that's not necessarily what, what I think um, is out there as a supply option. I think what, what we're looking at really is, um, uh, is a market that that would send the right signals when needed. Because the moment you have supply shortage in a functioning market, that translates into price hike. And that price hike will inevitably trigger that odd cargo that's lying around there somewhere to come into this Svenusio or Kirk or somewhere in southern Italy um, to supply the market when the market needs it. And yes, that comes with a security premium. There is a premium. Uh, to it, but it is a premium that you, you that would you would pay in any market under that conditions, under those conditions. So I'm 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 not so worried about the question where the source is. I'm more worried about whether the price signal will be right, if need be, if the Russians go funny, and uh, and that's exactly where I think we need to go back a little bit to the question of whether all the countries in the European Union actually implement what's needed, the regulation, the regulatory frameworks, the software, and all the rest of it. And here, 
this is exactly where I, I have my doubts still a little bit. This is, this is where the, the weak chain, uh, the, the weak parts of the chain is. And, and if, maybe let me conclude with that, if we have a problem with the, European, uh, with, with the Russian gas going forward, it's not the Russians that we need to blame. It's really the Europeans themselves. Because if they don't, if they don't get the rack together when it comes to the internal market making project, you know, what else can, can I mean, this is, this is the one thing they can do. If they don't do it, well, don't blame anyone else. Just a, a comment, too. Um, if you watch what the Russians have done or tried to do since there's been concern about energy security, their reaction has been to create economic competitors, to undermine the investment uh, advantage of actually building, say, a southern corridor and, and, and effectively stopping development on some of the gas fields you just mentioned that could be developed because it just doesn't make economic sense. So a funny thing about markets is they, they kind of creep in and, and you eventually start using that tool as opposed to the old-fashioned ones. Um, so that, that's an interesting thing about just this codependence. Um, in, in trying to react to that threat, Russia simultaneously makes, it more, makes itself more dependent on Russia, or, or sorry, on Europe, and in which case it makes it even less likely that they'll use that hammer in the future because they really can't afford to push away that partnership. So it, it really does kind of thicken the relationship in a way um, at a decentralized level with too many interests at stake even internally in Russia uh, at that point uh, because a decision in Russia is no longer just a single centralized decision but in fact you have actors within Russia who are hurt by that decision and you have to deal with the, the, the internal domestic politics as well so it's a it's an interesting kind of almost a it was a simpler world without markets almost and the markets make it so thickly related that it, it's hard to think. We still think in, in an old-fashioned way, but the, there's a lot more subtlety. I, can I come on that? It, it, it seems to me that um, countries that have, tool, have power do it where they can. So in a sense, maybe the Russians have used the more aggressive tool where they could, and that would be Georgia, and then that would be you know, Crimea. And then in the context of the EU countries, it's a very different situation. The United States it behaves similarly. We would never invade Europe. <laughs> we have other tools. <laughs> we have friendship networks, etc. But it's just interesting to think about that there's zones where you behave in certain ways because you can, and there are other places where there are other relationships in place where that makes it a lot more difficult. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've got the political scientists talking at, at this corner. I mean, I was interested when you said that regulatory frameworks say one job, and that's uh, security for investors, so that they know when to invest. Well, now you've already given it a, a, a moral, entity, a moral direction, if you will. You know that it does have a purpose, and it's to help. And so I had a little trouble with that. There's a whole question of what is neutral. I mean, for me, when I was listening to you recount the, the Russian perspective with regard to the triggers, my thought was, yeah, and Japan just wanted a, you know, an economic co-prosperity sphere. I, 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 this is where, for me, the political primacy, uh, I don't believe that actors behave rationally. Uh, if, you know, um, and then to insult my, my dear friend Rob here, the economist, you know, assume a ladder. Um, uh, that's the famous joke there. You know, okay, so you've got a doctor, a lawyer, and, a, and a, an economist in a, in a hole. And uh, the priest is praying, and the doctor is trying to says, "I'll help anyone who tries to climb out." And the economist says, "I can get us out of this hole. First, assume a ladder." Uh, and so, so that so I was just going to that punchline. But for me, yeah, if, if everything's working properly, then the markets will work properly. But the problem is that there are lots of different entities putting their thumbs on the scale and are skewing things. And I think the and I, I do think the Russians had something very much in mind when Kiev changed their their government, and and they used this as a pretext. And so that's always always a question here. What is the real the real primacy? And and if the Russians are using things political things as a pretext, then I think you have a the, the, certainly the economics plays a role. But it it it's it's not you can't depend on it for for, for the logic that it has the internal logic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, and, and I would like to take one more question. Yes. No. Well, okay. well, then let's take is there another question? question? Otherwise, we'll just kind of finish it up. Good. Well, very quickly, um, EU energy regulation is not neutral. There is already a huge bias in this, and, and that's a consumer bias. It's regulated for the consumer benefit. So, um, and I totally agree, regulation is never neutral. 
uh, there, is, there is a purpose of regulation, and in the European case, it's consumer benefit. Uh, you can regulate differently. You, know, you can regulate it in favor of you know, incumbents or whatever you, whatever you want to do, but there is a, there is a bias there, um, and, and I appreciate that. Um, I think very quickly on, uh, uh, on, on Ukraine, I think the, the big issue here, and that's where politics kick back in, it's simply the timing. I mean, you can take issues with contracts and violation and all the rest of it, but when do you take issue with that? And, and, the, re and, and the moment the Russians took it, or Gazprom particularly took issue with it, was when the Orange Revolution happened. And, uh, you know, so the, the, the timing was very much a political one. Um, maybe, maybe, if, maybe one, one more just thought here on, on the question of, um, of markets and I totally agree, markets make the job a lot more difficult for a lot of actors than, you know, in, in, in the old world, where you have a long-term contract and a producer and a consumer and a long, you know, in 25 years of contractual relationship, single decision, single decision makers, you know, contracted volumes, price of, of gas just being pecked to the price of oil, job done, you know, I mean, the sing simple world. And a world that really prevailed until t 10 years ago in Europe, it's unbelievable. Um, so, but, but what it does some really, really interesting in Russia uh, itself, I mean, the for the sake of the argument, if Gazprom would not deliver molecules into Europe, there, is at least, there are at least two companies, or decide at some point to not do this, there are at least two companies in Russia that I could name that would step in immediately and would happily do so. Right? One is Novatek and the other one is Rosneft. Both are now, uh, uh, Novatek anyways, because it's a, it's a gas company, a private one, and Rosneft is a big, oil, uh, the, the oil giant, but with a huge gas gas com uh, business attached to it for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and and those, are, those are two players that have become really, really strong in Russia and have now started to kind of, you know, s to push Gazprom away a little bit. Gazprom now still sitting on the export monopoly. Those players don't like it. Novatek is lobbying against it. Now they're exporting LNG. Gazprom doesn't like it. There's a huge, there's really interesting domestic political economy dynamics going on in Russia. And, and Gazprom is not the player that it used to be. It's not this, this monopolist that kind of decides on everything. To the contrary, they have, been, have become very much under pressure. And there's a whole bunch of actors within Russia that would very much like to see Gazprom tumble and falter. Um, so, so the next hiccup might actually, if it comes, might help those players and, and, uh, and weaken Gazprom's position even further, which is really, really ironical. Which gets me to a final point. There are certain type of weapons you can only use once. Mm -hmm. And I guess the energy weapon, if it ever existed, is a wonderful prime and a prime example of this. It has been used once, maybe twice, 2006, 2009. It triggered responses. The responses are a totally different setting. It's a setting that's a lot more complicated with a lot more different dynamics uh, characterizing uh, energy markets, and I guess that's exactly what does away with, with uh, that whole energy weapon business. Uh, you can't use it, again, at, at least not the way it was used last time around. So the Russians, if at all, need to come up with something new. I would really would very much like to see what that is. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a couple of announcements to close. Please do fill out a feedback form and give it to uh, one of the graduate students uh, in the back. We have uh, a couple of um, events coming up on Thursday, we have Dr. Megu Charaf from Bucknell University look, talking about the refugee crisis at, at probably 5.30. Well, I believe, we believe it's at 5.30. It's here in the Berry Center. And also on November 13th, we are hosting uh, Mr. Anders Fogh Rasmussen, who is the former Secretary General of NATO and former Prime Minister of Denmark. And that will be at... 5.30, I believe. So anyway, they're, they're out on the web. They're out on the home pages for the school and for the Center for Global Studies. Um, please, thank you for coming, and please help me thank our panelists and Dr. Goldthal. Thank you. I'm pretty sure it's 5.15 was just too weird, and we were, we were sitting there.